Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to welcome our speaker and our future listeners. Uh, and apologies for some technical issues, of course. Uh, throughout May, as our listeners already know, uh, Institute for Cultural Relations Policy provided a series of online video lectures where we hosted uh, experts of different fields who provided overview of recent events. Uh, they draw attention to examples from various fields and uh, regions. The reason why we decided to have video lecture series are recent rapid social changes that are taking place globally and those that affect all people's uh, lives uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a few wor words also about our upcoming webinar. Uh, we will have last webinar of this month on uh, Friday about post-COVID international order. Um, outline of the session is following. We will have lecture first and after that we will have Q&A session uh, and the speaker will be asked questions those participants send uh, while they're registered. The duration of the lecture uh, of the session uh, will be um, 40 to 50 minutes, including uh, question and answer session. Um, and uh, today we are hosting speaker from Hungary. Um, a session will be about an uh, unprecedented global economic crisis. We are honored to host uh, Professor uh, Peter uh, Christian Zahar. Um, he is Associate Professor of the Faculty of Public Governance and International Studies at the National University of Public Service. Um, please, we can start already our lecture. Thank you for the kind introduction and the big hello from Budapest Professor, to everybody. Can you, hear, can, um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the invitation. Um, and I hope that I can contribute to the success of the webinar series um, with some thoughts today. Um, it is an honor to be here and I would like to thank everyone who has just logged on to this presentation and uh, I hope that you will have a good uh, reading here with me. Um, the title uh, was chosen quite provocatively. We don't really know yet how bad this crisis will be, but we can see that uh, many more people will be affected than in the last crisis situations we have experienced especially in the developed Western world. Certainly we are living in historic times and the frightening thing about that is that the most analysts are really clear on this. Um, it's not because of the terrifying pandemic only. We've seen, I think, similar terrible epidemics before and probably it is not just because of the economic crisis. Uh, this is not really new either. But all this together can lead to um, drastic consequences, I think, uh, in our known world order, which was created after the collapse of the bipolar world. Um, there have been crises time and time again. Um, the history of the 20th century has taught us that economy can drag entire regimes into the abyss and can also be blamed for um, the death of millions. Since the breakthrough of liberal capitalism, Europe has repeatedly exposed um, to its crisis, uh, which often led to a worldwide spiral. Already in the 1870s, the Austro-Hungarian Danube monarchy suffered a severe blowback, which led, for example, um, for government crisis in Hungary. The current crisis, however, um, calls us back first and above, I think, all to the history after the First World War. First, it brings parallels to the Spanish flu from there, and then it awakens uh, traumatic memories of the so-called Great Depression from 1929. As a consequence of this crisis, the instable Weimar Republic fell, and uh, Due to that, I think the first liberal world order which was established in the Paris and Washington peace treaties after the war actually collapsed like a castle of cards, especially in Europe. Instead of the League of Nations and instead of um, international peaceful cooperation, authoritarian regimes and state economic governance was every day's reality in the 30s. But even after the Second World War, 
there have always been problems in the world economy questioning the existing world order. Already in 72, if you already know, the Bretton Woods monetary system collapsed. And just the following year, we saw the politically motivated um, first oil price shock, which was initiated, uh, I think, mostly by the Palestine question, um, and which primarily caused huge damage in the Western Hemisphere. The second oil crisis of 79 then led to severe setbacks on the international stock exchanges in the 80s. And after the political turnaround in 89 and after the collapse of communism, everybody focused, I think, on a new European integration. But what we saw first was a huge European currency crisis in 93. And this was then followed by an Asian crisis of 97. And finally, I think we can mention the collapse of dot-com speculations in 2000. And we all probably still remember the last financial crisis, which began in late 2008. So you see, there, were, there have been always crisis situations for the economy and for the world order. However, I think none of these modern time crises has even remotely reached the destructive power of the world economic crisis from 1929. Back then, the economic output in the USA and in Western Europe, for example, fell mostly by a good quarter between 29 and 33. And the recession of the crisis we saw in the last years rarely led to such a severe setback in every country than a Great Depression. It is important to note um, that this mother of all crises in the interwar period, um, I think, did not have a single monocasual explanation. Several crisis phenomena occurred simultaneously, and they just overlapped each other. And this is the main reason, I think, why the Great Depression has such an impact on history. Just to give you, again, a less known example from my country, from Hungary. At that time, Hungary was a classic agricultural country that was hardly integrated into world economy. After the First World War, instead of a well-functioning economic community, the common market of the Habsburg Empire, as uh, uh, historian John Komlos just called that economic community, um, we have a new reality in Central Europe. It is just 100 years ago that the peace dictates finally broke the monarchy. Hungary lost two-thirds of its territory and one-third of its population. And after that, we see the rise of nation states in the region that are using protectionist economic tariffs and taxes against each other. Already the father of the interventionist economic policy, um, John Maynard Keynes, who you might know, has referred to these problems in his book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace in the Early 20s, when he predicted uh, a long-lasting economic chaos. And this could appear not only in Germany because of the reparations, but also in Central Europe. This is the reason why, together with the great historian John Lukács, who just died a year ago, I believe that there are two sides of this matter. Hungary regained its state sovereignty, but this was a tragic result of the nation's self-determination independence. But due to this geopolitical condition, um, I think the Great Depression just came to our region only belatedly. At first, the stock market crisis and also the subsequent crisis of heavy industry, which occurred in Western Europe, did not have particularly serious consequences in Hungary. Only after 31 did the financial system collapse when the international financial world, and especially the Vienna Credit Bank, which was very important for Hungary, was unable to provide further loans and a particularly severe agricultural crisis just set in. So we must interpret the international crisis as an overlapping chain of events. In addition to the significant economic and political role of agriculture, which led to a prolonged global depression of the primary sector, there was a 
war-related upheaval in industrial labor relations, which contributed to the crisis. As a result of the trade union movement, um, the distribution relations between capital and labor shifted, and this led to falling corporate profits and high unemployment. In addition, uh, there were the consequences of stock speculations, as you know, on the New York Stock Exchange. You all remember Black Friday, which is in our minds. But in reality, in 1929, there was no Black Friday. The speculative bubble first bursted on a Black Thursday, the 24th of October, and then on a Black Tuesday, the 29th of October, 1929. And we have another more side of this crisis, the monetary side, which just intensified all the events. In Europe, the gold standard had been established as a system of, uh, we call it fixed exchange rates against the US dollar. But this meant um, that international coordination fell just into the hands of US monetary policy, represented at that time by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The increase in interest rates to counter speculation in the stock market and then the limitation of money supply in the market led to the Great Recession we know. At the end of the chain was an international banking crisis. You have to remember at that time the collapse of 50%, 50% of all banks led to a collapse of the whole money supply and to a collapse in lending. Today, fortunately, we hardly see these many aspects at the same time. We are facing a crisis in which I think it seems that the nation states themselves have largely initiated the closure and isolation. And I think this is followed by unseen unemployment in recent years or the bankruptcy of commercial enterprises, which we didn't have in the last decades. Um, but I think we need to bear in mind some lessons from history, and this is why we have to deal with the questions of the Great Depression. Um, during the last uh, financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, uh, the well-known Berkeley professor, uh, Christina Romer, uh, pointed out that in a deep economic crisis, policymakers should have no scruples about economic stimulus packages. And this is what we have to see. She recommended that those who are politically responsible should uh, not hesitate to launch major economic stimulus packages. Uh, because with her uh, uh, former uh, uh, research, she has just found that the budgetary discipline in the late 20s intensified the crisis. And it would also be important that the, the recovery of the financial sector and real economy go hand in hand. When we see the crisis from 29, we see that um, only after the stock markets rose and bankruptcy rates fell, recovery could begin among the banks. And this led to further growth in the real economy. What could help is probably a real financial injection to boost the economy and also an international stabilization program to provide financially weakened, emerging and mostly developing countries with new capital. Um, we do not yet know whether that is what we are facing. Therefore, we have a lot of questions. What does the economic crisis mean for us, for everyone now, here today? And I believe uh, that as long as this economic downturn continues, really large masses of people will be clearly negatively affected in their way of life. This is something that raises big questions. In the West and through globalization in many parts of the world, people have adapted to the liberal way of life, which will now be challenged by travel restrictions, by restrictions on the media, restrictions on freedom of speech and assembly all standards of living will be negatively affected, I think. And I know that previous webinars have dealt with these questions. 
and the economic issues in this regard are part of an even bigger debate, I think, and which I can see from the program of the webinar series will be on the agenda again for the next session of the discussion too. So this is really, really an important question. And that big question is, how will we live after Corona? What will the world order look like in the post-Corona era? Current developments suggest that despite the economic issues, we apply a conservative interpretive framework. For me, who dealt with international relations, this can currently only be a realist theory. We must know thoughts from the past that show us the consequences of the current situation. Ideas of great realist theorists like Henry Kissinger, Kenneth Waltz, John Mearsheimer. What does this realist theory mean in the classical definition? Um, Kenneth Waltz, who wrote uh, the well-known book Theory of International Politics back in 79, stated that uh, the state's interest provides the spring of action in today's world. The necessities of policy arise from the unregulated competition of states. Calculation based on these necessities can discover the policies that will best serve a state's interest. Success is the ultimate test of policy, and success is defined as preserving and strengthening the state. So why can we choose this definition and this framework as a starting point here? Because we see a real global crisis with global economic consequences. But in the treatment of it, nothing else is expressed, in my opinion, but the reaction of individual states. The spread of the virus has been global, but in its management, we barely find any traces of international cooperation. It has been handled, I think, entirely on the level of nation state. Overall, the response of countries, governments around the world to this so-called COVID-19 epidemic um, has been mostly a failure. Uh, and this has been primarily a failure of global governance, in my opinion. Nation states consider their own interests first and shape their foreign policies, economic policies accordingly. So I think we should take a look uh, how have the individual actors reacted in the last weeks, last months. Let us first look at my immediate region and uh, the research area I'm dealing with uh, more in detail. The European Union. Um, I think if we are looking at the EU, um, we, we are disappointed. We are really disappointed. It, now at times the European Union is divided in both ways, externally um, through a Brexit situation we just can't handle until today, and also internally um, through, let's say, democracy debates for example, in Hungary and Poland. And in addition, there is also a weakening of the most important duo in European integration, the Franco-German axis. And more recently, um, the big question of an EU community of law was raised by the German Federal Constitutional Court. So we see Europe has a lot of troubles. The European Union as organization has a lot of troubles. And the quick widespread of that virus just took Europe by surprise. Um, if you look back the articles from early March, I think the citizens of Italy and Spain were already experiencing very serious consequences of the virus. But the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, she hold a news conference devoted to her first 100 days in office, uh, had nothing to say about this virus. Only one minute of that press conference was related to the, to the epidemic. Nobody at that time knew that the spread of this virus would evolve so rapidly. And there were really no coordination in the response and measures. Uh, when we look back, we see just member states starting to act separately. This is why Italy, the first and most dramatically affected member state in the EU, um, received 
assistance from China sooner than from the EU. It is, I think, no coincidence that the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, just had to apologize to the Italians for the EU's late reaction afterwards. And when we look at the actions the states just made, um, member states have shut down international airports on their own. They decided to introduce strict border controls or to close borders fully. And just weeks after the EU Commission decided to close the EU external borders for the first time in history, um, we have Schengen zone for 25 years now, and the borderless area had never been interrupted to such an extension than today. And this is why the EU's image um, or the popularity of a pro-federalist position, let's say, are greatly undermined. Why? Because each EU member state has responded to the epidemic on nation state level, and action at EU level has been almost completely absent. Even the fact that the EU provided substantial funding um, to help member states didn't help in this picture. It improved the EU's image only slightly. Um, why? Because it is clear that a strictly national approach, combined with a lack of sharing of best practices, um, have resulted in, in very different levels of effectiveness. And the spread of the disease in each member state was also different. I think mostly because uh, people just don't identify with a super state, with a supranational bureaucracy in Brussels. They need other identification at the local and national level. And there is still a lack of trust towards Brussels. And from Brussels, solidarity is still lacking in connection of the member states. Many people just think that Brussels or the European Central Bank in Frankfurt is just looking at the bottom line and they just don't see behind the numbers. This is why possibly a lockdown is aggravating tensions in civil society today. Um, if you look to Germany, there are numerous demonstrations against the strict rules and the European economy is threatened with losing its basis of prosperity. I think that global political influence of Brussels has never been less than today. And what in the field of European economy? Um, here have the also only, I think, let's say private attempts. Uh, each state has tried to find answers on its own. When we say that Brussels uh, lately just provided substantial funding, um, then we see no new money because no new money from Brussels could be mobilized within the community. Um, there was a support in the reduction of the various economic criteria, even in the Eurozone. And the use of the funds from uh, the seven-year budget, which are left, uh, can be started on a broader path. But until today, there is no central financing from Brussels for the crisis. The Franco-German leadership was only able to come up with a new reconstruction plan, I think, three months after the outbreak of the European crisis. And this is already under criticism, as we see today in the news. The net contributor states, uh, who are paying more to the common budget, uh, do not want to co-finance uh, states who are indebted in Europe. This uh, uh, huge recovery plan from, from Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron, uh, a Macron plan, as it is called in news today, is to allow um, the EU Commission to borrow on the financial markets on behalf of the EU to fill a 500 billion euro reconstruction fund. The money would then be paid out as a non-repayable grant from the EU budget to the most affected uh, areas and countries in Europe. Um, this is very more remarkable because Germany had a very different view on economics in last recent years. Um, but um, therefore, this decision could be revolutionary. But we have negotiations still ahead. And uh, it seems that the breakthrough um, will be very hard. Um, but in this way, Europe could prove really solidarity. 
and really that solidarity for Europe is uh, not just an empty concept. The idea behind this is that if uh, the countries stand up together, they can borrow money on more favorable terms than many governments could do on their own. The initiative brings new impetus to the European debate and may distract from the uh, various uh, situations like Brexit or the democracy debate I mentioned. Um, I think that this proposal would be a big step towards a truly functioning monetary union. But uh, uh, it is a, a real question what this idea will bring. Um, the idea of solidarity in this proposal would really be if this was no loan and no credit to the states, but in fact sums of money that uh, you don't need to pay back. This would be real solidarity. This would be social cohesion instead of a debt-based economy like we have today. Why? Uh, just because uh, every loan must be ultimately repaid by the taxpayers, by the little man, as you know, in economy. And therefore, real solid relationship would ease tensions. If we again create a huge debt in all countries, then in short, short time we, have, we will have debates in Europe all around about the cancellation of these debts. Otherwise, the EU could really fall apart. Um, but all this is still in, in, in the start. We, we just don't see how it will evolve. And uh, we just don't know the consequences. Therefore, we have to look at the whole world again. In my opinion, on world politics, we see a power vacuum at the moment uh, that has risen mostly because the USA has clearly lost its leading role in a lot of questions today. Um, although Donald Trump keeps appealing to the classic rules of a realist theory, especially with his battle cry, America first, as you know, um, the view is um, now emerging that, that the USA are not strong enough some other actors can feel this because of decay to management of the pandemic in the United States. It seems that the US cannot even solve its own problems and let alone the whole rest of the world. We do not see any leading answers, no clear direction that would lay the foundation of a foreign policy to face strong challenges of our time, like the virus, like uh, climate and environmental uh, problems like terrorism, like mass migration. But what are the reasons that the USA could not solve the crisis? Is it only the Trump administration? I don't think so, not at all. Um, my colleague and uh, international relations expert Zoltan Feher from Tufts University and MIT stated in a recent article that uh, there are three very important factors that have certainly contributed to this situation. Uh, he pointed out that uh, the federal structure of the US government, which has produced fragmentation of authority and capabilities, uh, had just a great impact how the US reacted. And he saw that the high degree of individualism, um, let's say the strong attachment to individual freedoms which is present in the United States and the role of state which follows to these freedoms uh, had also an impact. The most lockdowns have been nothing more than just an advice, stay at home advice from the state governor. And the third important reason is a socio-economic reason behind the extent of the outbreak in the United States. Um, I think it is because a uh, privately operated and fragmented healthcare system is present in today's United States. And all these have led to the greatest unemployment and the fastest economic collapse in 100 years in the United States. The GDP of the USA um, had a nearly 5% decline in the first quarter of this year. And analysts expect an almost unprecedented 30% contraction in the coming second quarter, which we are just coming to an end now. Since the pandemic in the USA worsened in March, more than 38 million people have already lost their jobs, at least temporarily, more than ever before uh, in such a short time. Uh, to give you just one example, uh, last week, almost 3 million laid off workers applied for unemployment benefits. And 
the unemployment rate was nearly 15% in April. Before the outbreak of the pandemic, it was about 3.5%. And how these questions uh, are connected uh, with healthcare and other questions. Due to the increase in unemployment, almost 27 million people can lose their health insurance because most people in the United States are insured through their employers. Um, and to put these figures in the United States in somewhat uh, historic light, I have just uh, searched for some very hard facts. Um, as we know today, about 100,000 people have died within two months as a result of the pandemic. If we look back to the greatest trauma of the United States, the Vietnam War, uh, the USA lost a total of 58,000 men during the war. During the missions in Iraq and Afghanistan, about 6,700 soldiers died. Um, in the First World War, the USA lost a 116,000 men. In the Second World War, it was just a little bit over 400,000 deaths. Um, if we now calculate these figures in terms of duration and days of the conflict and of the pandemic, the USA has suffered 600 deaths per day in recent weeks. During the years of the Second World War, that was barely 300 deaths per day. So the tragedy that the USA is experiencing can be understood a little better through these numbers. This world power is not used to having to deal with such losses. And where will the end be then? Uh, these numbers are just the West as we know it. But the disaster, I think, uh, will be even more dramatic in other regions of the world. The situation in Latin America, or the crisis in Africa shows that their individual states, um, I think, would not really survive a full lockdown and would immediately enrich the ranks of the failed states, where first the economy and then um, state administration collapses completely, which could lead to violence and, of course, revolts everywhere. And uh, if the leading economic powers themselves face ruin, um, they will not be able to provide any aid, any development aid in the poorer regions of the world. Um, when we look back again, some 13 years ago, when the global financial crisis began, uh, the economy was not able to prepare for it at all. And um, it could hardly take any measures. Uh, billions were just threatened in all countries, all over the world. Um, responsibles in banks, uh, uh, financial firms, uh, companies in all sectors, politicians. Um, uh, we were just looking into deep black holes. And especially when the banking crisis in Europe uh, developed into a real euro crisis, when you remember. Um, the slump on the stock markets at that time was only made up nearly six years after. As a result, Key interest rates are still at unprecedented lows today, and the importance of central banks in supporting the economy has, uh, I think, been greater than ever before. And this time, it seems to be even worse. Um, the crisis is really hitting all major economies, including China at the same time. This has never happened before. What is more, um, uh, I, I think that the, the crisis has two pillars we have to talk about. Uh, on the one hand, it is a supply shock, and on the other hand, we see a demand shock. And it is having an impact at an unimagined pace, uh, a consequence of the world's ever closer economic integration we have just seen in the context of globalization. The supply and the demand shock just began in China, as you remember, in January. The Chinese government reduced massively production in the country, restricted public life. Uh, everything was subordinated uh, uh, to the containment of the virus. And uh, partly because the country had to fear for its business model, um, which is being factory of the world, which is uh, being manufacturer of 
an immense number of goods and also on products that are sold globally and then again used in some other products. This immediate stop by China meant, uh, I think, two things for the whole world. Necessary products are not available uh, for the time being or are available in much smaller numbers. And the Chinese are reducing the consumption of goods, um, mostly of imported products. So we are in a downward spiral again. Production declines due to a lack of supplies and consumption declines due to the shutdown of production and measures that will contain the virus. We see that these circles then find their way into the financial sector, into the oil sector. Um, barrel uh, was never cheaper than before. Uh, logistics, flight industry, uh, into all service industries we know, such as tourism or other services. In Europe, for example, small and medium-sized enterprises in gastronomy, tourism, um, cultural industries, retail trade um, are still, I think, the most affected. Um, world oil price has reached, as I just said, historic lows in April and May. And what said uh, politicians, what said those who are in charge of economy? Angel Guria, uh, who is the Secretary General of the OECD, just said that for each month of containment, there will be an estimated loss of at minimum two or three percentage in annual GDP growth. At the moment, forecasts tell us that something truly historic is happening, I think. Some economists already are talking about the biggest fall of GDP since uh, 1929. The numbers they are mentioning are terrifying, I think. Western Europe uh, will see a backlash between 6 and 15 percent. And as you already mentioned, the USA, up to 30 percent of the GDP. However, we must bear, um, I think, one thing in mind with these numbers. Um, the liberal economic order had clearly challenges even before COVID-19 and showed signs of fatigue. Or perhaps um, um, the global economy has really already reached one of the well-known Kondratayev cycles. You know, uh, the Austrian national economist Joseph Schumpeter just prognosticized uh, that, uh, that these cycles will bring upswings and downturns every 25 to 30 years. And maybe we are now in that cycle again. Um, and there have, have really been great uh, challenges for economy. Uh, just say the rising labor costs in the whole Asiatic, uh, the emerging of a, trade of a trade war, you know, between USA and China, or robotics uh, and progress that makes human labor unnecessary. Um, these are, can cause troubles in our Western world. And, you know, uh, we, we do not know yet uh, how severe the losses will be. We don't, do not yet see what the real consequences will be but the possible scenarios are very bleak. Um, and I think that at the moment there are really no signs of real international cooperation. Uh, in my opinion, this is the case because uh, the first wave of the pandemic has hit mostly developed countries with advanced healthcare systems supported by strong governments. And they have taken measures independently without any international organization. Although nation states accept that the crisis is global, they think and act that the solution is national. If we take a look at other parts of the world and again at history, uh, we can see that developing countries have historically been um, more willing to cooperate with international organizations and NGOs because their lack of resources and uh, because of their administrative incapacity, I think. Nowadays, uh, if we take a deeper look at what is happening, we can clearly see the realist thesis of international relations confirmed. The world's two largest economies are attacking each other rather than cooperating in the fight against a deadly virus. And uh, the USA is withdrawing from the financing of the World Health Organization, uh, expresses criticism again and again against the United Nations. And this is a dangerous sign for the weakening of international organizations. It seems that with the end of US political and financial support, 
um, international organizations, let's say their effectiveness, their accountability, just will be questioned by other international actors as well. Um, I think many questions could still be raised, which, which we have to deal with in, in, in further webinars. Uh, but, but I know that the time is short. Uh, but I would just like to point out that um, both the political and the economic order in the aftermath of this pandemic uh, must address a lot of issues. Um, and what we see is that there is really a lacking international community. And again, I think it's also because of the lack of response from the international community itself. If we are talking about uh, the World Health Organization, there is no visible sign that, uh, that this organization is uh, working just to link the different health authorities in the mostly affected countries together to coordinate a cooperation. Or as we mentioned, the European Union, again, um, the most consolidated regional organization, I think, in the world. But it failed to take common steps until today. And the EU health agency, you might know the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, uh, continues only to offer situation reports instead of effective measures for containing the virus. So uh, I think that this is a failure of international organizations. This is why my realist approach in international relations continues to deal with the structures of an anarchic international order where individual states and power politics are the most important actors. This is, let's say, nothing new in the world. Uh, conflictual relations will continue to, to, to dominate relations between the global players. Um, and uh, what does it mean if I try to formulate some final conclusions? Um, I think first and most important is that uh, the pandemic may not only bring about an, an unseen economic crisis, but also the end of a liberal world order as we know it. There is a huge debate today between um, Henry Kissinger and Joseph Nye about that future order. Maybe we can talk about it uh, in the next uh, webinar. But uh, the current uh, so-called liberal international order that was established by uh, the United States and its fellows after the World War II, uh, it is uh, really in a, a question situation. Uh, what will the world look like afterwards? And uh, more and more uh, even realist uh, foreign policy makers are calling for international cooperation in this situation. Um, and we have to answer questions to that. How will we work after COVID-19? How will the world, uh, the world look like after the pandemic? Um, and everyone will see, I think, their own view strengthened. Representatives of liberal institutionalism, yes, we need more institutions. The socialist economic revolutionaries, yes, we need a new economic order. Sovereignists and nationalists, yes, only national states can solve the problem anti-globalist movements and localists all will produce their own interpretation of events and this will create an even stronger polemic about our future world. And I believe uh, building this future will depend on a well-guided, critical, pragmatic correction of the existing liberal system. It would be a chance to build a better world as we know it, maybe with more virtue maybe with morality in politics. Let's see. And thank you for your kind attention so far, and I'm ready for questions. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, analysis and already some introduction uh, to our next topic that we'll have on Friday, which is international order. But now, as you already mentioned, we will move to our Q&A session. We have two questions for you. And the first question that um, our uh, participant asked is, uh, what do you think how the economic situation will be look like after pandemic in the Central Europe? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, as we see, uh, the crisis hit Central Europe uh, somewhat differently than the West. Uh, the figures for losses, illnesses are far behind uh, Western European or American levels. We do not yet know the reason for this. 
uh, but maybe some vaccinations in previous ages or even the time reaction of governments and really hard measures of social distancing uh, uh, may have contributed to that. Overall, the Visegrad countries, as we call Central Europe, the V4 governments, reacted to the crisis relatively fast and I think assertively compared to some Western European states. And I think that there is also in the V4 citizens uh, a naturally feeling for social distancing <laughs> and they just follow the restrictions of the government. The economy, however, uh, has to face the same problems as in other parts of the world. Uh, Although the, the Visegrad countries have repeatedly been able to formulate new solutions to current problems together in recent years, you know, like migration or European affairs, uh, we unfortunately see no regional cooperation uh, in economics at that time uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the closing of the borders uh, was decided unilaterally. Uh, there is no mediation of best practices or hardly to see a cooperation for delivery of medicine and supplies. Um, and and uh, uh, what we see in the last weeks is also a one-sided lifting of the lockdowns from the countries, a, a, a lifting of restrictions just to speed up the economy. Um, and we do not yet know uh, whether the economy, uh, how the economy will react. All of the V4 economies are very open at the moment because these countries built their economic success of the last decades uh, on the participation uh, in the, let's say, international division of labor. So the countries of Central Europe are clearly dependent on exports and are clearly exposed to the trends in European and especially German economic development. So we have to wait and see what happens in the coming period. I think uh, the economic impact of the pandemic emerged from several dire directions, as, as I mentioned. Uh, we were talking about it on the demand side. Uh, the quarantine measures caused a significant drop in demand for the most products, particularly tourism is affected in Central Europe. And all services requiring the presence of personnel are badly hit. On the other hand, as we saw the supply side, uh, this, this suffered also because government decreased uh, to close uh, various locations like schools, universities, restaurants, pubs, you know, uh, and to, to, to ban all public gatherings, this, this had an effect on the supply side. Um, one of my, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, the Polish analyst Tomasz Kasprowicz, has written an article in which he expresses that uh, uh, the biggest short-term problem uh, for Central Europe could be the liquidity of companies. Um, but the economy shutting down many companies could have faced bankruptcy within a very short time. Um, I think this was one of the main threats, uh, and this is where uh, we now have, I think, a, a little hope that this will not happen. Uh, the big issue could, could have been if there is no one to pick up the rise in demand, and many chains of cooperation would be broken down if, if, if this happened. Um, maybe the, the, this worst scenario is now gone at the moment, but in principle, uh, we can expect a recession in most Central European countries, uh, mostly in, in, in both quarters of the first half of 2020, and uh, we hope that uh, this will be better in the second half, and this is a positive scenario, uh, assuming that, that uh, the pandemic can be somehow contained and will, will not return in fall again. We, we don't know if it returns, what will happen. Uh, yes, truly, we don't know, and all the governments are uh, having different analyses. Either it will come back or not, we never know. And um, the second question is, uh, what measures uh, are in uh, sight uh, on supranational level to tackle down the crisis uh, in Europe? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I tried to mention uh, in 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 my, my speech that there is a French-German plan for recovery of Europe. Uh, we don't know still the details. This is a vague plan. Uh, we still don't know how will the common market, the Eurozone, the so-called uh, multi-annual financial framework function in the future. We don't see uh, if stimulus and exit strategies taken by the European Commission and the European Central Bank uh, will be a, let's say, sufficient response to this crisis. Uh, the, in the EU, not only the recovery funding, but also the reopening is a hard issue. 
as we see, some states could reopen sooner than others, uh, and given the differences in the, in, the, in the levels of infection. And this lack of joint common ground could lead to new controversies within the European Union. So, so I think the EU faces a lot of challenges at the moment with the rise of populist, eurosceptic forces. Uh, there is a hard dispute between member states on sovereignty, uh, on the enforcement of common EU legal norms, and uh, there is a core debate about uh, values and democracy. And what will now, uh, a very topical issue, uh, the different economic philosophy of the states of the Union. Uh, this is why I think that this German-French plan is revolutionary, as I already mentioned. Um, uh, the, 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 there is one question I, I would like to mention. Uh, for me, this, this new German-French plan clearly involves a revolutionary idea uh, with a jointly implemented debt and financial aid coming from Brussels. The balance of power between European headquarters in Brussels and the nation states could be shifted. I believe that the European Commission is uh, becoming more powerful through this proposal. And I think this is what counts for Angela Merkel today. This is her legacy. That is what has now led her to turn around in that policy. The European Commission is now becoming an independent player on the capital market. The Brussels, the Brussels uh, Commission uh, is gradually taking on the form of a real European government. Instead of a voluntary technocratic union on finances, we are coming to a real political union with this proposal, I think. And here we can still uh, draw another uh, 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 very good explanation of international relations. It is the so-called constructivist theory about images of self and others. And if we look to this theory, then we can interpret the attempts uh, which were made by Germany and France clearly as a, a uh, attempt to change the image of these countries. When we look back to 2015, you remember the migration crisis, refugee crisis. Um, I think it was a clear attempt of Angela Merkel to reverse the historical image of the Germans uh, into the opposition. Instead of nationalism and rejection of foreigners, we have the, uh, the sentence you still remember, the Schaffenas, we can do it. And today, if we are looking to the economic side of this Macron, uh, Macron plan, uh, I think that the, this duo wants to reverse the image of the thrifty Germans, of the Germans who uh, despise other states economically and financially. Germans are also doing their Art and probably provide the largest sum of money ever to cover the new Corona Recovery Fund. So help is at hand and Germany will keep the lead in Europe with France. So I think this, this could also be uh, behind this plan and we will see what will happen if, if the other states who are uh, not willing to finance at the moment uh, can come to a conclusion and to, to a real good deal at the end. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again for your valuable content, theoretical and practical analysis. Uh, and I want to thank also the authors of the questions. And again, thanks to you for dedicating your time. If you wouldn't like to add uh, anything, we can hear finish. Um, if you can have, if you want to have some final remark. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me, and I hope I contributed to the success of your webinar. Thanks again. Thank you very much. I want to remind our viewers that our next session will be on Friday uh, and see you until then. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.